All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the first in the new series of Astroparticle seminars. And I'm very happy to introduce you to our speaker today, Tim Linden from Stockholm. Uh, Tim did his undergrad in Northwestern, uh, the PhD in UC Santa Cruz with a visit in Fermilab. He was a postdoc at Chicago and then a postdoc at Ohio State at the Center for Cosmology and Astroparticle Physics, where we shared an office during a year and a half or two years. Uh, he's now uh, assistant professor at uh, Stockholm, in the Oscar Klein Center. And uh, he, Tim has worked on a, on a very many number of, uh, very large number of interesting topics in astroparticle physics. Uh, this includes, just to name a few, the galactic center DBXS, by contrasting the dark matter versus the pulsar interpretation, a number of Fermi analysis, uh, gamma ray millisecond pulsars, TV halos around pulsars, the Fermi bubbles, the positron fraction in cosmic rays, uh, solar modulation of cosmic rays, uh, high energy emission from the sun. And today, Tim's going to talk about the thermal wimps on the brink. So uh, take it away, Tim. Hi, uh, thanks for having me. And I uh, hope everyone is doing well. And uh, it's good to, uh, to see you all, at least in this virtual sphere. So today, I'm going to talk about uh, where we stand in terms of searches for thermal wimp dark matter and what the future uh, looks like. And I'm going to concentrate in particular on uh, cosmic ray searches uh, for wimp dark matter. So everything we know about dark matter at present is due to its gravitational interactions. Uh, we have really uh, excellent high precision maps uh, from the cosmic microwave background, uh, from the organization of clusters of galaxies and large scale structure, and from observations of things like the collisions uh, of galaxy clusters, uh, for example, in the Bullock cluster, that give us really precise information about the gravitational interactions of dark matter. These also tell us a lot about dark matter's particle properties. For example, it bounds the mass of the dark matter particle to within about 87 orders of magnitude. So starting from that very precise information, we need to decide what is the dark matter that we're looking for and what is the particle nature of dark matter. Many things can fit in to 87 orders of magnitude of uncertainty. Um, so dark matter could be something like an axion. It could be a sterile neutrino. Uh, some sort of composite particle, primordial black holes. But what I'll focus on for, for the substance of this talk is weakly interacting massive particle dark matter, uh, also known as WIMPs. And so when I say thermal WIMP dark matter on the brink, what I want to bring up is the question of, can we not focus on individual WIMP models, say, you know, ADG, the two bottom quarks, we rule this out or we don't rule this out. Can we rule out entire classes of dark matter models? Can we constrain the WIMP parameter space of dark matter? Can we do that in general? And yes, I take some um, kind of motivation from early experiments in direct detection. One large class of models was any dark matter particle that interacted uh, with nucleon by exchanging a W or Z boson. That predicted a cross section of around 10 to the minus uh, 38 uh, centimeters squared. And uh, that was entirely ruled out by experiments in the late 1980s. So by doing these experiments, they ruled out that cross section and they constrained the entire class of dark matter models that interact uh, through WRZ boson exchange with the standard model. What does this mean in terms of wimp dark matter and more generically in terms of thermal dark matter? So I'll take any thermal dark matter particle as a target to be a dark matter particle that achieves thermal equilibrium uh, at some point in the early universe, and then freezes out of that thermal equilibrium uh, to produce uh, the dark matter density we see today. So this is a picture by Sarah Sabo of uh, the early quark gluon plasma, during which period the dark matter particles would be in equilibrium uh, with baryons. So this uh, starts uh, with a very high uh, dark matter density. Uh, dark matter density that remains in thermal equilibrium with baryons would overclose uh, the universe. But as you leave thermal equilibrium, you know, in this stage, baryonic particles are crashing into each other and becoming dark matter. Dark matter particles are crashing into each other and becoming baryons. But as you leave that, that thermal equilibrium, the dark matter continues to be able to annihilate away, producing more baryonic particles and diluting the dark matter density. And the WIMP miracle is just the statement that if the cross-section between two dark matter particles, if the probability of those dark matter particles finding each other 
is the weak interaction cross section, which is already known as a, as a fundamental cross section in physics, uh, then you get the right dark matter density today. So you start with the thermal equilibrium, you put in the known weak force to dilute the dark matter density, and you get the dark matter density we observe today. The second part of the, uh, the WIMP miracle is actually sort of an annoyance. It's that this is a relatively mass independent statement. So for dark matter masses of one GeV, or dark matter masses uh, of 100, uh, 1,000 GeV, or, or even up to 100 TeV, you get out almost the same dark matter density today, regardless of what the uh, initial mass of the dark matter particle is. So that means we have to span in search of fairly large parameter space. So this is what we're left with. We're left with this picture of cosmology where we have a very early quark gluon plasma, we have thermal equilibrium, then the dark matter freezes out. Eventually we get the cosmic microwave background, the dark ages, reionization, et cetera, et cetera. And eventually because of the Hubble expansion of the universe, dark matter is not annihilating so much anymore. It's frozen out, the dark matter density is locked in. But there are still residual annihilations that are not greatly affecting the total dark matter density, but are potentially observable. And we can set that cross section as what is seen on the right this thermal annihilation cross-section of around uh, two to four times 10 to the minus 26 uh, centimeter cube per second. And the philosophy of this talk is to try to constrain and rule out that simple model first before we deal with any other complexities that might exist. So the thermal wind paradigm actually tells us much more than just search for this cross-section. It tells us, for instance, where to look. If we have a particle that comes into thermal equilibrium and it's a massive particle and then it cools, we know what the dark matter density throughout our universe looks like. We know what large scale structure looks like. We know where to point our telescopes. Uh, in particular, we know that dark matter densities tend to peak at the same spot coincident with the centers of baryonic densities. Uh, and, and in fact, the, the correlation is reversed. The dark matter density is larger, so dark matter forms structure first and the baryons follow along. But we know when we point towards the centers of galaxies, we'll have a rapidly increasing dark matter density. And because the annihilation rate goes as the density squared, we'll have a very bright annihilation signal. And these are some different profiles uh, for a dark matter density in the center of a galaxy like the micro, uh, Milky Way. And we know we can point towards the centers of those galaxies and potentially uh, see a bright signal. The WIMP miracle uh, or WIMP process also tells us what energy range to look at. If the dark matter has masses between 1 GeV up to 100 TeV or something like that, and it's basically at rest, which means most of its energy is its rest energy, and it can annihilate, these are all things we're told by the thermal wind process, then it's going to produce a bunch of particles that have energies that are just below the mass of the dark matter particle. Because what we're gonna do is we're gonna take the dark matter's rest mass equals mc squared and turn that into baryonic particles, and those baryonic particles are gonna be highly relativistic at those energies. So this is very different than what we get from astrophysical processes where we tend to get power laws due to things that are accelerated by electromagnetic fields. Uh, there are certain spectra that come from turbulent accelerations or shock accelerations um, in at, uh, astrophysical environments. And so these tend to lead to smooth spectra and we can look for bumps above that. And we're going to wanna look at that, ener at that energy range between one GeV up to 100 TeV. So what are the different targets that we can look at? We're over here at Earth in, our, in, in the Milky Way galaxy, not to scale. And dark matter annihilates, also not to scale at some other point in the galaxy. And it could produce gamma rays. Uh, immediately, you know, dark matter annihilated, it produced some bottom quarks. Those bottom quarks hadronized, those had, uh, those, that produced pions. Those pi zeros decay into gamma rays. And those fly straight into your detector. They're not obscured by the galaxy. And you can detect them and find out where they came from and what energy they have. This annihilation event could also produce cosmic rays. Uh, you can get protons, antiprotons, anything that happens when you annihilate and produce a bunch of, of energy. Uh, protons, antiprotons, positrons, electrons. Those can also then propagate through the galaxy and make it to your detector. But because they're charged, uh, they're going to get um, uh, turned around by the magnetic fields of the galaxy. So they're not gonna follow straight line paths. They're eventually gonna diffuse. That means they might make it to Earth but, and we might be able to use our instrument to record what direction they came from, but that doesn't give us any information about where they originated. You can also get secondary radiation. 
For example, if this cosmic ray was moving through a galactic magnetic field, at some point it released uh, radiation in the form of radio or X-ray emission, and that reaches our detector. Again, we can point where that came from, but that doesn't necessarily tell us where the dark matter is. This is the status of thermal wimps, and it's uh, extremely frustrating. So we have a thermal wimp paradigm that tells us how many, let's say, gamma rays we expect from the center of our galaxy. The thermal wimp paradigm tells us where to look, tells us what energy to look at, gives us a prediction shown here for a very standard 100 GeV dark matter particle with an NFW profile annihilating the bottom quarks. Uh, this is totally detectable. We, the, the Fermi Space Telescope, which is in space right now, would see this. If this was the only thing that was there, we would detect it within a matter of, of weeks. But we look at the background of, of gamma rays from the galactic center. We actually do see them, and they look like this. And this is based on two totally different sets of physics, right? What went into the dark matter was the NFW profile, the thermal annihilation cross-section, uh, the dark matter mass and annihilation fi final state. What went into the astrophysical contribution is things like the star formation rate of the Milky Way, whatever's going on at the central black hole, uh, different hydrodynamics and shock acceleration forces, totally different. Uh, and it turns out that the total flux that we see from their combination is a factor of 10 larger than the dark matter prediction. Not a factor of a million larger, uh, but also it's not the dark matter prediction. It doesn't mean the dark matter isn't the dominant term. So we could look, for instance, at uh, dwarf galaxies. Maybe we'll move out of the galactic center and look at smaller galaxies that don't have such a large baryonic contribution. We detect many gamma ray sources with the Fermi telescope. Uh, this is the gamma ray flux of the sources we detect on the x-axis and how significant these sources are, cutting off at a five sigma significance on the, on the y-axis. And this depends on uh, where different galaxies are in our universe, what radio galaxies are, how active galactic nuclei work, all sorts of things. And the dark matter contribution from dwarf galaxies surrounding the Milky Way are predicted to produce new point sources that are down here, about a factor of 10 lower than our detector sensitivity. Again, not a factor of a million lower, but also not detected. So maybe looking at gamma rays with Fermi isn't the right thing. We could look at, say, antiprotons. Dark matter annihilates somewhere in our galaxy produces antiprotons, those antiprotons get to Earth. We have a picture for, for what we're supposed to get, a, a very detectable flux with instruments like AMSO2 uh, from dark matter, and the line is plotted right here. And then we look and we obtain data, and that data is here, about a factor of 10 above the dark matter prediction. We can do the same thing maybe with positrons, for example. Instead of looking with antiprotons, the dark matter prediction is here, and the astrophysical contribution is a factor of 100 larger. So this is maximally frustrating. It would be very easy if the dark matter signal was dominant in any of these channels. Then we would just look with the telescopes that we already have available. We would either find it or we would roll it out. It would also be easy from my perspective if the astrophysical contribution was a billion times brighter than the dark matter prediction because I would give up. And then I would know that I don't have to do anything anymore and I would, I would look at more interesting problems. But a factor of 10 is solvable if you work hard enough. And so that is frustrating. So this is what you would typically like to see. And this is, this is my, my plot of maximum frustration. Uh, on the x-axis, we have the fraction of uh, a dark matter annihilation event that goes into some observable that we can look at. And on the y-axis, we have how specific that observable is to dark matter. And where we want to be is on the top right of this plot. Something dark matter is very good at doing, something very, baryons are very bad at doing, something that astrophysics can't do. Um, and uh, we definitely don't want to be in the bottom left of this plot, or maybe we do, because we would know we don't want to use things in the bottom left of this plot, things that dark matter doesn't do very well, but astrophysics is very good at doing. And it turns out, for all the observables we have, they, they form something like this. On this perfect line, where if dark matter tends to produce a lot of this emission, like gamma rays or positrons, then astrophysics does it as well. And things that dark matter is, is preferentially less good at doing, producing antiprotons, producing antinuclei, uh, baryons are also less effective at doing it. And so it just makes the uh, detectability, the observation equally hard among all of these different paths. So it is possible that the gods are spiting us with this. Uh, it is also a clear, true statement that we are in fact the enemy here. 
uh, AMS would detect in uh, a dark matter um, annihilation, uh, you know, a thermal WIMP model in the Milky Way would be detected by AMS in antiprotons and positrons. A thermal WIMP model in the Milky Way would be detected by the Fermilab telescope in the galactic center or in dwarf spheroidal galaxies if there were no background. They would produce photons, they would produce protons and antiprotons uh, that we would see, we would observe, and we would know what the rates are. Uh, the only problem is the astrophysical background which happens to be a factor of a few brighter in, in every case. So by understanding our astrophysics better, we can try to peel that background back and, and look at the, the uh, dark matter signal that's uh, underlying. So in, in this talk today, I'm gonna focus on two of these. Uh, so typically uh, maybe we also talk about the galactic center excess and gamma rays, or we talk about dwarf spheroidal galaxy limits. Um, I'll show a few plots right at the end that have those limits on them. Uh, but what I really wanna look at are our models of antiprotons and heavier antinuclei and their detectability uh, with telescope or instruments like the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which is sitting here on board the International Space Station and taking data. So what is the antiproton excess? It's a measurement of the antiproton fraction that reaches Earth. So you have uh, protons are accelerated primarily in supernova events. So a supernova explodes, it produces a huge shock front. That shock front uh, produces turbulence, which accelerates protons uh, to very high energies, reaching from you know, a GeV all the way up to maybe a PeV, and maybe even higher in different astrophysical or extragalactic environments. It doesn't produce a lot of antiprotons. And the reason in that supernova don't produce a lot of antiprotons is that it produces turbulence and magnetic fields that accelerate whatever is there, and the stars are made of matter and not antimatter. So there just aren't a lot of antiprotons around. They very rarely get accelerated. The way you do get antiprotons from astrophysics is the following process. You accelerate a very high energy proton. That proton then propagates through the galaxy. And it's, at some point, it strikes uh, an atom uh, gas molecule that's floating through our galaxy. And then that's just the hydronic interaction, like at a particle accelerator or a beam dump experiment. You have one very high energy uh, proton, an energy of GeV, TeV, PeV. It smacks into a gas molecule that is at rest, uh, and it produces uh, a nightmare of hydronic interactions. Uh, and that includes antiprotons, more protons, pi plus, pi minus, positrons, electrons. Eventually, most of the things decay, and you're left with protons, antiprotons, positrons, electrons. Even the neutrons decay in astrophysical contexts. Uh, into more protons and antiprotons. And what we measure, and then these things continue to propagate, they uh, eventually make it uh, fight through the solar system, make it to our experiment near Earth, and can be detected. And what we typically try to measure is what's called the antiproton fraction, which is the fraction, uh, the flux of antiprotons divided by the flux of protons. And the reason people will tend to measure this fraction rather than the raw antiproton flux is that this eliminates certain detector systematics that might be common to both protons and antiprotons. For instance, how big is the instrument? What's, you know, what's the acceptance of the instrument at 1 GeV versus 2 GeV might be the same for protons and antiprotons, and so the uncertainties in that can cancel out in the, in the ratio. So this is uh, what you expect from astrophysics on uh, the right. Um, the antiproton ratio uh, as a function of the kinetic energy of the antiproton. It starts as a very small number, about 10 to the minus five protons become antiprotons. This rises a little bit as a function of energy because uh, the very low energy protons uh, can't usually produce hydronic showers that are energetic enough to produce new antiprotons. So it's small at very low energies and increases up to a maximum of about two times 10 to the minus four at about 10 to 20 GeV, and then starts to decay after that. The reason for the decay at higher energies is because the protons start escaping the galaxy very efficiently uh, because they're not turned by magnetic fields as the protons reach very high energies. On the left, we see a dark matter prediction. So this is uh, 75, 74 GeV dark matter, uh, which was picked because it fits the galactic center excess. Um, 74 GeV dark matter annihilating to bottom quarks um, and the expected contribution to the antiproton ratio. It's not quite up to 10 to the minus four, right? It's about a factor of 10 lower, but it's a very bumpy spectrum. 
So if this astrophysical contribution is very smooth, we can look for this sharp, bumpy thing uh, that might fall right below it. So here's what the data looks like. Uh, this is early data, not very exciting. And the interest that we could find this is not so high. This is the level of excitement as a function of time, I think. Um, data is getting more precise, and it's looking very much like the astrophysical contributions. So uh, not much excitement from the dark matter perspective, but a lot of excitement from, you know, this is a correct model because this model was made and it's fitting all the astrophysics. But then suddenly AMS data comes on. And look at the astounding precision of the AMS O2 data set. There are error bars in all of those red data points. They are just much smaller than the data points themselves. And so that gives us kind of astonishing statistical precision that we can use to look uh, for bumps or wiggles that might be due to a dark matter signal. So the excitement is quite high. The excitement is in two places. One is up here at an energy of a few hundred uh, GeV. And you can actually see visibly the hardening of the antiproton uh, ratio here compared to the model prediction. Uh, this is thought to be astrophysical um, and due to the reacceleration of antiprotons that are, you know, the proton hits gas, produces antiprotons, but it's still, it does that when it's still inside the supernova remnant. And so then the antiprotons actually persist or like remain in the supernova remnant and are reaccelerated to higher energies again. And so this produces a hardening of the high energy spectrum, which is expected. And so I'm not going to talk about that in this talk. What I'm going to talk about is this little bump here, which you cannot see by eye, uh, but is uh, statistically significant. Um, and so there was actually a hint of this way back in uh, the Pamela data set, which is the predecessor to AMSO2. Um, you can see here on the uh, top the model predictions for the uh, uh, positron or for the antiproton ratio and the excess of the data above the model on the bottom, uh, which is pretty statistically significant, although most of those error bars are correlated. And so what it leads to is kind of a two to three sigma statistical preference for an extra component that is due to dark matter. And that would have a mass here. And so let's look at this plot on the bottom left because uh, this will show up quite a bit. This is the dark matter mass on the x-axis going from uh, 100 MeV which is kind of the minimum thermal wimp mass, or at least in some models, all the way up to uh, one TeV, which is not quite as high as the maximum mass of the wimp, but is you know, a large region of parameter space. And then the thermal annihilation cross-section that gives us the right dark matter abundance today is shown uh, as that dotted line that stretches across this plot. And the cross-section you would need in order to produce this many extra antiprotons from dark matter lies directly on this part of the plot a mass of about 30 uh, to 70 GeV, and an annihilation rate of about two times 10 to the minus 26. So this was a little bit exciting, but it was only about two to three sigma. With the AMS data, it became much more significant and slightly moved to higher masses, which I think is also uh, important that these are not totally consistent uh, data sets. Um, so there were two papers that came out on the same day, um, one by Tsui et al. and uh, one by Kuoko et al. Um, and they both looked for these excess bumps. So you can see here, maybe it's clearest in the plot by Tsui et al. Uh, he, there's the data set with very, very small error bars. There's the astrophysical contribution in green, and then the extra bumpy contribution from dark matter in yellow. And so it's producing just a few extra, um, you know, five to 10 GeV antiprotons that are helping it fit the data better. And because the statistical significance or the statistical precision of that data set is so high, that actually has a five sigma. Uh, that model is, is preferred by five sigma in the Tui et al. data. The same is true with Kuoko et al. And it's maybe a little bit clearer to see here. If you look at the bottom, they show a residual plot uh, that shows that there are a number of data points uh, in uh, magenta at about 10 to 15 GeV that lie above the best fit data point. And that is a better fit in models with the dark matter contribution. And if you put these all on the plots, uh, they look pretty compatible with each other. So there's the uh, uh, Pamela data set uh, uh, with uh, Dan Hooper, uh, myself, and Philip Merch. Uh, then the Tsui et al. and Kuoko et al. data sets on, on the same uh, mass per lane. And then a, a later analysis by Elias Cholas, uh, myself, and others uh, in green. And so all of these seem to be consistent with a dark matter model annihilating at the thermal cross-section with a mass of about 70 GeV or so.
So th this is quite exciting. But there's a lot of uncertainties that go into this and which need to be solved. We need to worry about the production of antiprotons. How many antiprotons do you get from a proton hitting gas? And at what energy do you get those antiprotons out? That sounds like a solved problem. It is, in fact, not a highly solved problem, especially when the cosmic ray is not a proton, but the cosmic ray is, in fact, a helium atom. And helium is also abundant uh, in supernova. And so that's a, a significant fraction of the total cosmic ray. Uh, uh, antiproton production as well comes from helium nuclei that are cosmic ray striking gas. On top of that, you have to deal with propagation uncertainties. How do these things move through galactic magnetic fields? How efficient are they at getting to Earth at different energies? And is that an energy dependent statement? Uh, you have to deal with instrumental uh, solar modulation, uh, which is that we are not sitting in interstellar space. We are sitting very close to a very energetic star. And it is pushing out a solar wind of charged cosmic ray particles and pushing out uh, magnetic flux. And any cosmic ray that is going to be observed by a telescope orbiting Earth needs to fight against the solar wind in order to make it to Earth. And that is time dependent, it is energy dependent, it is charge dependent, it is rigidity dependent in a complicated way. And, th and those uncertainties need to be dealt with. And then finally, you have to deal with instrumental uncertainties. Uh, how is our instrument performing? Are we measuring all of the antiprotons correctly? Are there any important systematics we might have to deal with? And the problem is with great precision comes great responsibility. You not only have to solve all these systematic uncertainties, you need to solve them all at the 1% level because the data is accurate at the 1% level and the uh, ex excess that is tentatively due to dark matter is a, is a few percent level excess. So you have to get all of these things right at a very high statistical precision. Let's look at the MEACH in a little bit more detail. So this is the antiproton production cross-section as a function of uh, energy and its measurement from different experiments uh, from ALICE, CMS, uh, a few other ones there that are blocked by the chat window for me. Um, and you see that there are actually fairly significant uncertainties at the level of a factor of a few tens of percents. Um, and these come in at different energies and different experiments have different values. So there is kind of a 10% uncertainty band here, and that is the size of the excess. On the other hand, this looks very smooth. It does not look bumpy. And the excess itself is quite bumpy. Um, so you can build different models of these. You can try to minimize over the different models that fit this data in some sort of Bayesian scheme um, and, and can try to, you know, uh, decrease the systematic uncertainty, or at least its contribution to the excess. And in, in a paper uh, by Reiner and Winker, Winkler, and then in a later paper uh, just by Martin Winkler, they argue that this can decrease the statistical precision of the uh, statistical significance of the excess from about five sigma to two or three sigma by basically producing what, what they consider to be better fits, uh, what a more skeptical person would consider to be more liberal fits, uh, to the antiproton production cross section. I'm not taking a stance on that. I'm just saying, like, you know, as you give more freedom to things uh, and allow it, to, you will always allow it to bump fit the excess to some extent. Uh, and so you need to be careful in controlling that. You also have to deal with uh, galactic primary to secondary ratios or, or use galactic primary to secondary ratios in order to help constrain uh, the bump in the excess. So for example, we discussed earlier that antiprotons are a secondary cosmic ray to, to cosmic ray protons. That means that most of them are produced by cosmic ray protons striking gas, produce antiprotons, and then those antiprotons propagate through the galaxy. There are other scenarios where, uh, other situations where that same scenario occurs, but where we know dark matter isn't contributing. Uh, the most famous is probably the boron to carbon ratio. So supernova have a bunch of carbon in them, so when a supernova goes off, it accelerates a bunch of carbon. There is no boron in the end stage of stars. And so there is no boron around when a supernova goes off. And no boron is accelerated as a primary cosmic ray by supernova. The boron comes from the same mechanism. A cosmic carbon ray is moving through space at a high energy. It's relativistic. It hits gas. And when it hits gas, it spallates that nucleus into boron and, and protons or you know, boron and helium atoms or things like that. So boron comes only as a secondary from carbon. 
And so if there was a bump in the antiproton to proton spectrum, there might be a similar bump at an identical rigidity or energy in the boron to carbon spectrum. So by trying to make models, and you can see here again with AMS data in red, there's very high statistical precision on these models of the boron to carbon ratio, we can constrain the contribution of changes in our galactic dynamics to the antiproton to proton ratio. We might worry about scenarios where the diffusion throughout our galaxy is not homogeneous. It's a sort of un unfortunate or fortunate fact that if we go back to this boron to carbon ratio, it's very, very smooth. It's basically a power law over several orders of magnitude and energy. There's not a lot of bumps. That's good because our models don't predict a lot of bumps. But what our models have is the galactic magnetic field has a turbulent spectrum that is the same everywhere. So diffusion is equally effective everywhere. And the energy losses are relatively smoothed out. They're just kind of the gas density on large scales. And these things are uncorrelated. Turns out that because all we have to work with is a power law that we can fit, that fits the data really well. On the other hand, the galaxy does not look homogeneous. There are places where there are supernovae, and there are places where there are not supernovae. There are places where there are spiral arms. There are places where there are not spiral arms. There are places that are forming lots of stars. There are places that are not forming lots of stars. These, play, uh, these regions clearly have different magnetic field environments. We know from radio observations they have different magnetic field strengths. They probably have different diffusion environments as well because diffusion depends on the magnetic field strength. The problem is there are about a million ways that you could change the diffusion parameters uh, to tune them to some sort of you know, observable of supernova rates or star formation rates or gas density rates or things like that. Um, and all of them can fit the data well because the standard model that does nothing can also fit the data well. So we know diffusion is highly inhomogeneous. We know that inhomogeneous diffusion can affect cosmic ray fluxes at some small level, but we don't know how to train that data set on, on our observations. So that remains a significant uncertainty as well. And then there's all of these uncertainties in solar modulation. So here are some raw proton fluxes that are reaching the AMS instrument as a function of time. And again, the extreme statistical precision of AMS uh, comes from the fact that they are measuring lots and lots and lots of protons, uh, billions of them which also means that you can start splicing this data into say time windows. You can, what is the daily proton flux? And you have plenty of protons per day in order to measure that with a lot of precision. And so here's the monthly proton flux at different energies. And this is now entirely due to solar modulation uh, because the, you know, the number of super, uh, uh, proton moves through the galaxy for uh, tens of millions of years after being accelerated by a supernovae the rate of those protons hitting Earth is not changing on month-to-month -month time scales. But the sun does change considerably on, on daily, monthly, yearly, and then eventually in an 11-year cycle time scale. And so we can try to measure the effect of solar modulation by measuring these changes in the proton fluxes as a function of time and figuring out how the sun is uh, changing the proton flux and then also changing the uh, anti-proton flux. This is not necessarily straightforward because these things have different charges. And so um, the solar environment is actually quite complicated because the sun is a dipole field and that dipole switches every 11 years. And so um, positively charged particles during a positively charged solar cycle, I'm, I might be off by a minus sign in what I'm about to say, have to go across the solar plane. And uh, the solar plane where all the planets reside is where the solar wind is active. And so they have to fight against the actual solar wind and move along what's called the heliospheric current sheet, diffusing as you see on the bottom right here on this straight line to make it towards the sun. And this takes a very long time, it involves a lot of collisions uh, against a wind that it has to push against. During a negative solar cycle, the positively charged particles come in from the polar regions. And there's no outflowing wind on polar regions from the sun because the sun is spinning like this. And um, so they do not have to fight against the solar wind. They make it in from the outskirts of the solar system to the position of the Earth in about two to three months, and they are modulated much less. And so taking our knowledge of protons and applying it to antiprotons is not straightforward. Uh, but for instance, measuring electrons and applying that uh, to antiprotons, which have the same charge, is maybe more straightforward. 
So here are some of these. Um, oh, here's actually a better plot uh, that has the right minus signs on it on the top right. My apologies. So here's here's one thing fighting against the blue line is fighting against the heliospheric current sheet uh, to make it in towards the sun. And the red line is something that's just moving in across the polar regions. Here are some of the solar observables. So what we tried to do is try to just fit this against observables of the sun. What is the bulk wind speed of the, the solar um, wind? What is the tilt angle of that current sheet, which is the black dashed line, wavy line on the top plot? Is that moving up and down by 45 degrees, in which case the cosmic rays have to have a very large amplitude that they have to fight against as they get locked to, to that current sheet? Or is it a very small wiggle and then they, do, they move less far? Um, and what is the amplitude of the solar magnetic field as a function of time? Try to take all those observables and fit them to this cosmic ray data here as a function of time and use that to predict the future contributions of solar modulation to these uncertainties. Uh, this is uh, done uh, by a paper with Ilias, myself, and, and Dan Hooper uh, for the protons. It was also done in the paper by Philip Merch uh, and a collaborator who is blocked, uh, Kulin. Uh, Kulin and Merch in, uh, in, uh, for the case of electron fluxes. So it's been done for protons, it's been done for electrons, and we can try to apply both of these, for instance, to antiproton uncertainties. Finally, we have to deal with instrumental uncertainties. And so here is the uh, AMS uh, data for antiprotons as a function of energy. And you can see some impressive things like at, you know, in one of these data sets, 16 to 18 GeV that I'm looking at, there's a 15,000 antiprotons, that's a large number. That means that the statistical uncertainty is actually smaller than the systematic uncertainty. So I'm showing the statistical uncertainties they calculate in red. The systematic uncertainties are in blue. And in most energies, those are a factor of a few larger uh, than the statistical uncertainties. So that means we have to treat all of these detector uncertainties in some detail. The issue with that is that AMS has not told us what the systematic uncertainties are uh, in the instrument. Moreover, most importantly for fitting these things, they don't give us a correlation uh, matrix between the uncertainties in one air band, uh, energy band and the uncertainties in all the other energy bands. So you would expect, for instance, if there's a systematic uncertainty of 5% because uh, we know that the uh, detector misreads 5% of the time, and so 5% of events are just missed, and we know that it's down by 5% at 10 GeV, it's probably also down by 5% at 11 GeV, but maybe it's only down by 4% at 11 GeV because it misses fewer events when they have higher energies. AMS does have this correlation coefficient. They have never released this correlation coefficient, uh, which is super important because that's the largest source of error. So what a couple groups have done, a paper by Heisig et al., a paper by uh, Budad et al., a paper by Kuoko et al., is try to back calculate this correlation coefficient by just looking at when this, you know, look at all the different energy bands, look at all of the different uh, uh, protons, antiprotons, boron to carbon, look at the different time cuts. When one thing is high uh, or low systematically, how often does the next data point tend to be high or low as well to try to back calculate the correlation coefficient? So try to back calculate it for protons or electrons and then apply that knowledge to antiprotons. That's a terrible way to do it compared to just knowing the correlation coefficient because you have a detector Monte Carlo, but it's all we can do. And unfortunately, these groups get opposite answers. So Heisig et al. and Boudat et al. both say that introducing these correlation coefficients decreases the statistical significance from about four sigma to about one to two sigma. Cuoco finds that it increases the statistical significance from four sigma to about six sigma. Both of these are possible, and without knowing that information from AMS, we don't know what the answer is. So that's the that's where we are for antiprotons. We do have an excess. That excess is very statistically significant, but there are a number of systematic issues, uh, both physical and detector-wise, that must be pulled out first before we can look for this. So, uh, so maybe we should look for some sort of signal from dark matter that is not a 1% excess or a, a few percent excess like antiprotons are. Let's look over something where dark matter is actually supposed to be a dominant contribution or maybe an order one contribution. And then we don't need to know things about detector systematics at the 1% level. 
Um, so this is the story of looking for cosmic ray anti-nuclei. Anti-nuclei are exciting because they're expected to be a clean search strategy. So what, what is an anti-nuclei? It's an anti-deuterium, an anti-helium, an anti-lithium, you know, something like this. Um, why are these not produced by astrophysics? Well, they're, they're not produced in the supernova themselves for the same reason the antiproton aren't, aren't produced. There's not a lot of antimatter around the supernova explosion, so we don't see these things. Moreover, there's a kinematic threshold in producing heavier antinuclear. So let's say I have a high energy proton with an energy of, uh, say, 3 GeV, and it strikes a gas molecule, and that gas molecule is at rest. The center of mass of this is only uh, something small. Uh, so it will produce uh, some particles that are moving slowly. Center of mass is like less than a GeV, but it can't produce something that conserves the, the you know, the smallest thing that produces an anti-deuterium, for instance, needs to produce an anti-proton and an anti-neutron. And then to conserve baryon number, I started with baryon number plus two. I'm inserting baryon number minus two. So I need to produce four baryons in my final state, which means I need proton, 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 or sorry, proton, proton, uh, proton, neutron, anti-neutron, anti-proton. And then those anti-proton and anti-neutrons need to, need to coalesce to form an anti-deuterium. That means that the minimum energy of the cosmic ray itself has to provide a center of mass energy that can go into 6 GeV of rest mass in that, in that uh, interaction center of mass frame. So uh, that means that the high energy proton has to have a really high energy. And really high energy protons are rare. Moreover, now I have a 100 GeV cosmic ray proton. It smacks really hard into a, a uh, 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 gas molecule. It produces a ton of things and can produce uh, a, a bunch of antiprotons and antineutrons. But those things are all now moving at a very high momentum inside of the lab frame uh, because the center of mass frame is now highly boosted compared to the lab frame of Earth, which means that anti-deuterons that come out, which are carrying a significant fraction of the rest mass uh, of, of this, uh, the center of mass energy of this thing, are also moving relativistically. So it tends uh, that cosmic ray interactions only produce high energy anti-deuterons and anti-helium events. There's a significant deficit of low energy anti-deuterons. And this becomes even more acute when you get to heavier things, anti-helium, anti-lithium, uh, the story remains. Dark matter is different. So the two dark matter particles are at rest uh, in the lab frame. They annihilate and they produce a bunch of energy but all of the rest of the energy is at rest. Like the center of mass frame is the lab frame of the Earth. So if the dark matter annihilation event has a relatively low energy, say it's two, you know, 30 GeV dark matter particles, it can produce a lot of anti-nucleons uh, that are relatively slow moving compared to the uh, velocity of the Earth. Um, so they're in the Earth's lab frame. So you can get a huge anti-deuteron flux uh, or anti-helium or something like that at low energies compared to the background. And so you can see here at low energies, uh, the dark matter prediction over the astrophysical background is uh, the dark matter is actually dominant by a factor of almost 10 to the five. So finding one of these things could be a smoking gun signature uh, for dark matter. And so there's been a search, um, I should point out, this was first pointed out by Fiorenza Donato uh, and maybe Paul Gondolo, maybe he's the other author on that in uh, 1999. Um, and uh, there's been kind of a, a process underway to look for these anti-deuterons uh, over the last 20 years. And so that's ratcheting up now with experiments like GAPS uh, that are large balloon experiments supposed to fly in the next uh, year or two. Um, the reason that you do anti-deuterons is because it's the simplest thing. So everything else gets rarer and rarer as you go to heavier anti-nucleon. And already you have a signal to noise of 10 to the five. Uh, so this is, this is a clean up. But AMS found something weird and unexpected. Uh, so in some talks given by the AMS collaboration, though not to date in a published paper, they have said in talks that they have observed eight events in a mass region from zero to 10 GeV that have Z equals minus two. So that's not an anti-deuteron, which has Z equals minus one. That would be an anti-helium nuclei. Uh, so it's all eight events are in the helium mass region. 
So they predict that the background probability of this is exceedingly low. So that's exciting, less than three times 10 to the minus eight. And they do some Monte Carlo to try to differentiate these for backgrounds. So this is really exciting. The problem is this plot. Here are the different antimatter fluxes that you expect from dark matter annihilation um, for, for different final states. So antiprotons are up there, uh, flux of about 10 to the minus two. Anti-deuterons are down by about six orders of magnitude. Anti-helium is down by another four orders of magnitude compared to anti-deuterons. So that's for anti-helium three. Then anti-helium four is down another four orders of magnitude compared to that. And if you note here, they say eight events uh, with z equals minus two, and these were anti-helium three. The current status of this, this was from a 2018 talk, current status now is rumored to be 13 events, and two of them are anti-helium four, which is very tricky because this should be 14 orders of magnitude rarer than antiprotons. And while we're observing a lot of antiprotons, we're not observing 100 trillion. So there was an effort underway, and some of this even before uh, the AMS collaboration, to try to boost this anti-helium signal even more. And so by changing some uncertainties in coalescence, which is how close the antiproton, antineutron, antiproton have to be in momentum space in order to form an anti-helium, right? So first you just form all of the quarks. The quarks form things like antiprotons and antineutrons, and then those things need to coalesce in order to form heavier antinuclei. And the effectiveness of that uh, depends on some particle physics uncertainties. So uh, a few groups tried to evaluate these and tried to boost this signal by a few orders of magnitude, but it's still quite small. So uh, consequently, after the AMS announcement, uh, a bunch of groups, ours included, uh, attempted to look into this in more detail. One idea was to astrophysically enhance the anti uh, helium flux. And the idea is you can boost this flux at low energies. This is good. I uh, get a few orders of magnitude enhancement at, at 100 uh, MeV. But the AMS sensitivity, if you look up here uh, on the top right, is in, in the region, uh, actually, sorry, in the bottom right, the blue band on the bottom right is for anti-helium. Um, this is most sensitive at about 5 to 10 GeV, which is not where this thing is being enhanced. So the idea was to use reacceleration from turbulent magnetic fields to take those low energy anti-helium events and then accelerate them up to high energies. And this is done through an alphanic turbulence term, which is standard in cosmic ray propagation, um, that um, leads to diffusion in momentum space. So it takes some low energy particles and makes them even lower energy. And it takes some low energy particles and makes them higher energy. But since all particle spectra fall like this, if you just diffuse randomly in momentum space, you harden the eventual spectrum. And so this leads to a much larger flux of anti-helium events at, uh, at high energy. Um, so if you see here, moving the alpha velocity from 10 kilometers per second on the bottom right to 60 kilometers per second can boost the detectable anti-helium rate by about two orders of magnitude. And predict, instead of the old prediction was that dark matter would produce like 10 to the minus four events, we now get dark matter should produce 0.1 events which is not 10 events, but you know it's, it's something. Here are the number of, of expected, and, and the other exciting thing about this is it's much more effective for anti-helium-3 than it is for anti-deuterium, which potentially explains why we're seeing this first in the anti-helium channel. We might also be seeing some anti-deuterium from AMS. AMS hasn't published their actual limit on the maximum number of anti-deuterium that could have been seen, and the detector systematics and differentiating those from antiprotons can be different for the different final states. So we can greatly enhance the anti-helium three to anti deuter ratio. An even more exciting thing uh, that we recently published this June um, was a particle physics enhancement to this, this state. And this relies on something that has been missed by kind of, I think is actually just totally standard model physics uh, that has been missed over the last few decades. And the idea was this, you have a particle code uh, um, like Pythia or Herwig that is going to produce showers of particles from a proton-proton collision. So to do LHC physics or something like that. You wanna form anti-helium or anti-deuterons out. And 
one out of every billion interactions uh, in these particle physics codes produces an antihelium. That's about the right rate. Which means either you put your set your Monte Carlo up on a large supercomputer and wait forever, or you do the following. You produce a million events. You figure out how many times I produce an antiproton, an antineutron, and in another antiproton anywhere in parameter space. And then I calculate the momentum distribution of all three of these things independently. I assume their momentum distributions are uncorrelated. And then I cross pollinate all million of events with each other to get a million to the third events for free. And then I just calculate the anti-helium production rate from that. That works okay so long as producing one antiproton going in this direction with this momentum has no effect on the probability of producing an antiproton or antineutron going in this direction with some other momentum in the same particle interaction. Once these things are correlated, this doesn't work anymore, and people have generally ignored them. A few people have attacked this problem, but then they made a different mistake, which is to simplify this calculation again they assumed that anything that lives longer than uh, about a nanometer uh, in, in, in light distance is uh, totally stable to decrease the number of particles in the shower and make things simpler. This should make sense because if I have a anti, if something that survives a nanometer, which is a really long distance in these particle scales, and then it decays, it should be in a different position space and it shouldn't interact with the rest of the shower. This is not true if it's possible to have one displaced interaction, which then decays to produce an entire anti-helium. And it turns out that there is one particle that does this really well, and it's the lambda B hyperon. The lambda B hyperon has a mass of about 6 GeV, which gives it exactly the right mass to decay into anti, oh, and it also has a, a baryon number that is already minus one. So this gives it the perfect setup to decay into antiproton, uh, antiproton, antineutron, uh, proton, neutron, with a baryon number again of minus one. So this four, and if it if it decays into those five things, those five things are naturally at rest with each other because there's no more energy in this problem. The rest mass was entirely converted into the mass of those constituent particles, and it turns out this works really well. So you produce a bunch of antiprotons and antineutrons, and they're by definition at rest with respect to each other uh, because of the kinematics. But the anti-helium they produce has a really high energy already because it gets whatever the boosted energy of the lambda B is, just transfers directly into the energy distribution of the anti uh, of the anti-helium. So you produce a bunch of anti-helium events compared to the background and you produce them at very high energies, which is where AMS is really sensitive to these things. So if you look at the bottom right of this plot, the standard Pythia models uh, and Herwig models are these dashed lines. And the models that include a lambda B contribution in Pythia and in a Herwig version that uses the events gen operator uh, are the solid lines and they're enhanced by about three orders of magnitude and potentially producing one event, uh, which is again, in, is not 10 events, but again, a huge enhancement compared to background. And like I said, this is based on totally standard model physics. Uh, it is somewhat annoying that Herwig's default implementation does not produce the right kinematic situation in its lambda B decays to produce this anti-helium flux. And uh, there's no current laboratory constraints on this. The two predictions from the best codes that are public and in the literature give you different results. And this is something that is still to be determined. You can even enhance this a little bit more by building models that decay and produce lots of lambda Bs, such as having dark matter annihilate through a light mediator, producing a bunch of bottom quarks that decay into lambda Bs efficiently. And then you can actually get 10 events in your most tuned scenarios. This is not what I would predict dark matter looks like, but if you told me, you know, uh, from on high, we have 10 anti-helium events, this is maybe the most feasible portion of parameter space that has a minimal adaptation of standard model physics to get you to that. Uh, moving these dark matter models is actually quite intuitive. So in the final three minutes of the talk that I have left, uh, and I know I'm going a little bit over, I wanna ask, where are we now? 
So here are the antiproton constraints. Here are the, um, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, the possible antiproton detections that we talked about in the first half of our talk. Compare that to the galactic center excess, which is in red, uh, which I didn't talk about today, but is another excess in gamma rays that's in the same portion of parameter space. And then limits from dwarf spheroidal galaxies, which are in potentially in some tension with some of this parameter space, but not all of this parameter space. It's a little bit frustrating because antiprotons are hard because we have to get a lot of systematics correct. The galactic center is hard because the astrophysics there is really bright. Dwarfs are supposed to be easy, but also the flux is supposed to be low. So dwarfs are a great place to set limits, and we got limits. The galactic center and antiprotons are a great place to detect the signal, and we detected the signal. How do we deal with that? We're again in a frustrating environment. But this is not necessarily the end of the story. Some people say, well, dwarfs are in tension with this, they rule this out. Let's note, this is for an assumption of the local dark matter density of 0.4 GeV per cubic centimeter. If you switch this to 0.5 GeV per cubic centimeter, this affects both the antiprotons and the galactic center uh, calculations, and they go like this and become pretty compatible with dwarf limits. If you move this to 0.3, it becomes pretty constrained by dwarf limits. The dwarfs don't move because their dark matter density is, is measured by a different uh, fundamental term. But there are important systematics in dwarf spheroidal galaxies that can potentially move this limit as well. There's a more recent paper compared to this uh, by Alex Geringer Samoth and collaborators that actually moved this up another factor of three in dwarf spheroidal uncertainties. So here's where all of these things lie. We have uncertainties from astrophysics, statistics, multi wavelength uncertainties, and in detector uh, uncertainties. Dwarf spheroidal galaxies are basically a statistical problem that we're going to try to account for in the future. Uh, things like the anti-helium excess are really just an instrumental uncertainty. If AMS is really detecting 10 anti-helium events, this is smoking gun new physics. It's not clear that it's dark matter, but dark matter is really the most reasonable thing it could be because the other uh, options are like anti-galaxies, rapidly decaying primordial black holes and things like that that are, that are also uh, you know, not uh, the most well-motivated models. Uh, dark matter becomes very well-motivated to solve that problem. Uh, the galactic center is really a problem of astrophysics. Can we separate uh, the uh, dark matter signals from the signals of positrons and things like that? Antiprotons are kind of in the middle of all of these, and we have to deal with all of these different uncertainties at the same time because the precision of the problem is so high. Or maybe the gods will continue to spite us, and we will always be right behind being able to detect this. Um, OK, I want to skip this. And now I just want to close with this picture uh, of a little bit of hope. So when I, I started in, in grad school in about 2008, 2009, this was every constraint that hit the thermal annihilation cross section. So there was a constraint on annihilation if it went into E plus E minus, which was not expected. Uh, a constraint then from the WMAP satellite on the reheating of the universe. And it hit the thermal cross section and ruled out dark matter models that annihilate electrons and positrons below 5 GeV. This is the status of the field uh, 10 years later. Uh, 10 different experiments, 10 different final states, a bunch of different probes, a bunch of different regions of interest. Some of them lead to detections, lots of them lead to constraints, and we're filling out this portion of parameter space. There's still a lot of work to do at high energies. There's still a lot of work to do in rectifying this situation in, in the mass range of about 70 GeV. And so there's a lot of hope uh, in the future. And so I'm gonna close there and uh, open for any questions and also mention that uh, if you're interested in doing this sort of science, there's a number of postdocs uh, now open as of today. I think the announcement went out uh, at the Oscar Klein Center. And you notice at the bottom right, there's a, a postdoc uh, uh, working with me and others on uh, particle astrophysics and uh, dark matter searches in particular. So uh, thanks. Thank you, Tim. That was great. It's a great overview. Uh, I want to ask if there is any questions from our audience. You can either, oh, yeah. And, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, one, I cannot uh, raise my hand because I'm uh, administrator of the meeting. So uh, thanks, Tim. It was a nice overview. Uh, I was wondering which is, uh, in your opinion, uh, the you know the most uh, promising opportunity to for the future among all these different experiments and different probes. Sure. Um, um, for all for the two I, I talked about today, I mean, I think. It's hard for me as an outsider to really judge the promise of the anti-helium uh, 
constraints uh, or the, the promise of detecting anti-helium because it really is a question um, that is, you know, they've detected 10 anti-helium events. They've detected 10 billion events. If you, what is the probability of one of those events getting misconstrued in their detector as anti-helium when it is really not? They show all their Monte Carlos and their Monte Carlos look very good, that these events look very separated from measurement uncertainties in the, the charge and mass ratios of protons, antiprotons, and things like that. But if you're dealing with a back, you know, 10 events against 10 billion events in your detector, you have to worry not about the two sigma uncertainties in that, but the three, four, five, and six sigma uncertainties in those miscalibrations. So it's a really tricky detector problem. Um, I, I didn't mention much that new detectors like uh, GAPS will come up. And GAPS has a really uh, nice system of detecting three um, X-rays that are produced in the in the interactions of anti deuterons and anti helium events uh, with their detector material, and that can be done at extremely high precision. And so, GAPS is a detector where, if you're looking for one event against a background of a billion events, the signature is so clean that you think you can trust that. So, I think that's interesting going forward. In anti-protons, uh, anti it's really just solving all of these systematics at the same time and trying to constrain them. Finally, I think the galactic center excess is still really interesting. Um, in particular, when new radio telescopes come online, like SKA, um, and this is uh, you know next uh, three to five years, SKA is either going to detect hundreds of pulsars in the galactic center, or it's going to rule out pulsar interpretations of the galactic center excess by not finding those pulsars. Models predict that those pulsars aren't there. There are some data-driven reasons to maybe prefer pulsar interpretations in the gamma ray data. Uh, but when we either see those pulse signatures, uh, you know, finding a pulsar once you find it in radio data is clear as day. So once you either find it or you don't, I think that really sets the stage for a lot of interest in, in the galactic center axis. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Uh, so let me just ask uh, the flip side of that question. Uh, why, what do you think is the dominant uh, uncertainty that is preventing us from claiming dark matter versus astrophysics in anti-protons or anti-nuclei now? Whew. I mean, I think, it, so, so one thing you, you run into, right, in this field, uh, it's what, what once you design a better mousetrap, you'll design a better mouse or something. There's something, some phrase like this. I don't remember what it is. Anyway, um, you you sort of think that certain things are clean signals, right? Yeah. If we found, let let's say we eliminated um, the antiproton production cross section as an uncertainty. We built a big collider experiment. We measured it for. Helium cosmic rays, anti-helium cosmic rays, we got a perfect 0.1% level precision on the anti-proton anti production cross-section. That's no longer an uncertainty. Like the other four uncertainties can all explain that as well, right? And they can all make 1% level changes. And so people who are skeptical of the dark matter interpretation, and you are normally betting very well when you're skeptical of dark matter interpretations, will move to those other ones. And they can all individually explain that excess, I think. And so doing solving just one of these without solving all of them doesn't illuminate things that well. Um, so I really do think it's making substantive steps in each one. I think there's a lot of promise for detector uncertainties, uh, or, or sorry, for anti-proton um, production uncertainties, um, that the collider experiments, now that they know that this is a key problem, that uh, you know it, it is a big deal. Can can look at this in more detail and design tests. I think there's a lot of promise in doing solar modulation uh, because it's time uh, charge dependent, and we can measure daily fluxes and we can build a model that encompasses this really well. Um, diffusion, I think, is harder to do. It's always possible that it just shows up in the antiproton channel. We don't really have a good constraint on all the different possible diffusion scenarios in our galaxy. So that's always something that we're going to have to deal with. All right. Thank you. Uh, is there any question in the audience? You can unmute yourself and ask. I have time for one final question. 
So hi, hi Tim, uh, you and generally here. Uh, so you, uh, maybe maybe could you mention a little bit? Uh, uh, could you develop a little bit more the um, maybe the, the interest of um, having also the uh, correlation of the uh, uncertainty on the modeling? Sure. Um, in the anti-proton channels, in the systematic formulation. Yes. Okay. Let me go back. Oh. Yeah. So. Um, Actually, I was talking about the, the uncertainty on on the the correlation of the uncertainty, but on the on the modeling, not on uh, the instrumental part, like uh, really on the. On the, on, on the prediction, like on, on, on these various components, like anti-proton uh, production, uh, like solar modulation, all this is affected by some uncertainty, which is correlated also in energy and so Sure. So, for instance, one thing we did in our attack on this um, is we just built an extra functional form that had three parameters. Um, that you know, take this best fit model to the antiproton production cross section, um, and then try to fit the data with and without dark matter. Uh, you'll find that the fit that involves the dark matter component improves the the log likelihood by something that's about seven sigma. Um, and, and, yeah, six or seven sigma in our model. Then take the antiproton uh, flux that comes from the astrophysics. And multiply it by a functional form that is like a constant plus e to the power one plus you know e to the power two plus e to the power three or, or log e's or something like that. So you can add wiggles into the astrophysical antiproton production cross section. What we found is, and and now what you're doing is you're just allowing that to fit in minuet or something like that. Um, these things are being correlated in some weird way, um, and they're bump hunting basically to try to remove as much of the anti-proton excess as possible. Now, eventually, we will just add enough free parameters that we can do this perfectly, and there will be no excess anymore. So where you stop doing that is challenging. And what we found is if you allowed a four, uh, four component fit, you would decrease the statistical significance from like six sigma or so to like four sigma. If you allowed a four component fit, it went down to like one or two sigma, or five component fit. So it was basically a question of how wibbly you allowed this thing to be. Um, so I think that is sort of a, a point towards your question. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's why. Like, it's. Um, I think that's uh, also uh, like a, a way to 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 be uh, to get a better handle on on this anti-proton excess. Uh, the fact that we have to assess, uh, estimate all the uncertainty from these different components, but also their correlations. And, uh, and then, as you just give the example, it can affect a lot the, the uh, yeah. If, yeah. It, and so one thing that's kind of interesting to know is like, once you get to like a three or four component fit, you're doing the fit from like two GeV to, you know, 100 GeV or something. And on both sides of that, the contribution of the uncertainties like flies off to infinity once you're no longer fitting there anymore because you fit some functional form that you know fits the data like like you would do with some sort of Fourier analysis and something where you're not fitting anymore it just flies off unphysically to crazy values and so at the end I thought our like we were still getting with the four component fit a decent preference for a dark matter model and at the same time the anti-proton production looked unphysical in a way that it was trying to bump hunt the fit away and not doing it. So that was to me some evidence that we were giving the model too much freedom and it was still preferring dark matter. But that's not that's not anything conclusive, right? That's kind of just like a feel for it. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially for this case, there are um, correlation matrices provided by uh, Korsmeyer, for example, for some mm -hmm. proton yeah, yeah, yeah. that can now be used. In so yeah, that, I think that's... Uh, actually, of course, my, uh, Michael Kersmeyer just joined the group here. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, um, yeah. thinking about that in more detail. But yeah, there, there's definitely ways to do this better. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you. All right. I, I think uh, we should stop here. Uh, thank you again, Tim. It was wonderful.
Uh, thanks everybody for coming and for your questions. And uh, uh, we'll see each other in October 26th and we'll hear about Uta Heidi Yikoti Grace from Denise Boncioli. Thanks, Tim. Talk to you soon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks, you, Tim. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye.